أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الحبيب المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا وأما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ثم لا تسألن يوم إذا عن النعيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد. Respected scholars, my elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أين محيي معالم الدين وأهله؟ أين قاسم شوكة المعتدين؟ أين هادم أبنية الشرك والكفر والطغيان؟ أين الطالب بدم المقتول بكربلاء؟ Where is he who revives back the teachings of our religion? Where is he, the one who brings honor back to the people who deserve honor? Where is he who annihilates the oppressors and the transgressors? Where is he who seeks revenge? For the innocent blood of the prophets and the progenies of the prophets, where is he who seeks justice for the innocent blood that was set, that was spilt on the plains of Karbala? These are some of the statements that we utter, that we mention, that are mentioned in Dua and Udba. The Dua that is very highly recommended to be recited at every occasion of Eid. And, and most certainly the day of Friday, which is the weekly Eid of all the believers. Within these statements, we are uttering some of the mission statements of Imam alayhi salam. What are we saying? We are saying when we, when we look at the traditions of Rasulullah, for example, and the various Imams, we find that one way to identify or one way to establish what is the overall mission of Imam alayhi salam, our Imam, the Imam of our time, we find many traditions in different ways saying, uh, in essence, this. His mission would be to, to fill the earth with justice and equality and peace and tranquility, just as it has been filled with oppression and transgression and corruption. And so we find within these small mini statements that we utter in Dua and Nudba, we are saying what Imam Alayhi Salam will be charged with. He, he will be in charge of reviving the religion of Islam. He will have to resuscitate that religion which had been buried. Which religion? That Islam which we, with which, which was sealed and approved on the day of Ghadir. His mission is to revive back that Islam. I ask you a question, is it not baffling and amazing that today, 14 centuries after the demise of the Holy Prophet, that the Muslims are able to identify and tell us the most intricate details of the Prophet's life? Which finger should we start cutting our nails from? When we go, when which, which hand to use when we want to eat? Which hand to use when we want to drink? How should we eat? What are the etiquettes of eating? What are the etiquettes of drinking? What food should we set first when we want to go to the washroom? Which way should we come out when we want to come out of the washroom? What should we pray on going in? What should we pray on going out? These are little observations that the Muslims at the time were able to make from the life and the behaviors and the actions of our Holy Prophet. 14 centuries later, these intricate details of the Prophet's life are being revealed, relayed to us. These have become the Sunnah of the Prophet. Mustahab acts, which if one acts upon, receives great benefit. Little conversations that took place in a corner of the mosque of Rasulullah between two people. 
and were witnessed by one person, those little conversations have reached us today. So all these actions, you will find in the traditions that they have been narrated by one person, two people, five people, ten people, a hundred people, becomes mutawatir, becomes something that is highly uh, accepted as authentic, especially if the sources are authentic. The smallest of details that were witnessed by one and two and five people have reached us today. But one event in the history of this, of the prop of propagating the message of Islam, in the history of the 23 years of, of the mission of Rasulullah, never has an event seen such a population being present in one place at one time. A hundred thousand to a hundred and twenty-five thousand individuals, men and women known as companions, witnessed the event of Ghadir. Yet today, the Muslims can tell me which finger to start cutting my nails from, but they are completely oblivious about the message of Ghadir. Why? Who is at fault? A man came to our eighth holy Imam, Imam al Rida alayhi salatu was salam. Imam al Rida alayhi salam enjoyed a unique position in society with regards to the rest of the Imams alayhi salam after Amir al Mu'mineen, where he was now selected as the second, as the crown prince to the greatest empire that this human race had witnessed till today. The greatest empire from a geographical point of view that the human race had ever witnessed. Imam alayhi salam was second in command. He was the crown prince of that, uh, of that empire. And indeed, the, uh, the currency started being published with the names of our imams as well in that era. And so the Shias and the lovers of the Ahl al-Bayt received some sort of respite, some sort of peace, relative peace, even if it was momentary. And so some of the practices that Imams السلام, always preached and encouraged the, Ahl, the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt to do became easily practicable in the era of Imam السلام, Like the traditions that we see of Majalis and of Matam and perhaps of Julus in the, at the time of Muharram and in the days of Ashura. One day a man comes to our 8th Holy Imam and he says to him, O oh, Imam, Ya ibn Rasulillah, why is it that you, the members of the Ahl al-Bayt, emphasize so much on Ashura and order your followers to place such emphasis on the day of, on, on Ashura and on the event of Karbala? Why? Imam replied in one line. He said, so that people do not forget Karbala just as they had forgotten Ghadir. We emphasize this so that tomorrow nobody can stand up and say Karbala act never happened. The day of Ashura is concocted by the Shias. Here there's a very beautiful story narrated with regards to uh, one of the greatest ulama of the last century. His name is Abdul Hussein al Amini, who known, famously known as Al Allam al Amini, the author of the book of Ghadir. Fifty years he spent compiling the different sources to bring this book of Ghadir to our hands. He went to the, to the remotest corners of India to find the sources and to, find, and, and, and to go to libraries and spend days looking for sources so that he can compile this book. Fifty years of effort he puts in eleven volumes. And there are two volumes which, are, which remain unpublished. Allam al-Ghadiri. Allam al-Amini, the author of Ghadir, was once walking in the streets of Najaf on the day of Ashura with a delegation of ulama from brothers, brothers from other schools of thought in Islam. And they were walking on the day of Ashura alongside Allam al-Amini in the streets of Najaf. When they had to stop for a moment to allow a, a procession, a julus which was passing by to pass. Within the julus, the people were practicing the various acts of azadari that are known locally. Matam, carrying the zanjir, carrying the banners and the flags for Imam al Hussein. And as they were going past, here the ulama, the brethren from the other schools of thought, saw, saw an opportunity. And they thought, why not ask a question here? And so they posed the question to Allama al Amini. They said, Allama, why is it? 
that you, the ulama, the ayatullahs, the maraja' of the, of the school of the Ahl al-Bayt, do not put a stop to these acts of ignorance that are committed by the ignorant ones amongst you. These were their words. Juhalakum. Why do you not put a stop to these acts of ignorance carried out by the ignorant ones amongst you? <coughs> Ayatullah uh, uh, Alam al-Amini was a very balanced personality. He, he had an aura about him. And so when he spoke, there was, there was something in his words that shook the hearts of the people who were listening to him. And this was an aura which was perhaps given to him as a gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the servitude that he had served Amir al muminin with. In any case, Halam al-Amini looked at them and he replied, He said, first and foremost, these people do not follow me. They do not believe in me and the, as their marja. They are following their own maraja, who have told them that the remembrance of Imam al Hussein in different ways is an act of, is a mustahab act. And worthy of thawab. And so they are following somebody else. So this question to me is in vain. Had they been following me, if they were my followers, I would have told them that these acts are wajib. <laughs> the ulama was shook. We are trying to taunt him. We want, to, uh, want, we want him to admit that this is ignorance. Instead, he's saying that they are doing an act of mustahab. If they were my followers, I would tell them this is wajib. Why, O oh, Allama Amini, why? He said, because we did not do, the, we do this so that nobody ever has the audacity to stand up and say Ashura never took place. Hussein was never killed by the army of Yazid in Karbala. In essence, Hussein died in Medina in his grave is amongst the destroyed graves of the Ahl al-Bayt. He said, we do this so that nobody ever stands up and makes the claim that the ignorant, ignorant ones amongst you made with regards to Ghadir. After he himself writes in his book Al-Ghadir, he says that after the event of Ba'tha, the proclamation of the Risala of Rasulullah, no other event, no finger-cutting event, no conversation between two people event, no which foot should we go in the toilet with event, no other event in the sunnah or in the history of Rasulullah had more narrators and more authors and narrators than the event of Ghadir, after the event of Ba'tha. He said there are more mutawatir ahadith with regards to this event than there is for anything else apart from Ba'tha. So not only was this event witnessed firsthand by over a hundred thousand people, but also it has reached us today in the 21st century from more sources than any other event at the time of Rasulullah. Yet people are oblivious about this event. Today they can tell you how to hold a miswak, which, which, how to, to bend it within your fingers. You go on YouTube and have a look. There are videos showing you which is a mustahab way of holding a miswak and how you should move from which side to which side. And if you do not follow this method, shaitan infiltrates in your actions. People do not have shame in narrating hadith in the sahih books that if a fulan person buys an onion from fulan trader in Mecca, he was bought a house in, Mecca, in, in, in Jannah. If he buys two, he bought two houses. If he buys three, he bought three houses. People do not have shame in narrating such traditions. Yet the tradition which has the most amount of narrators, nobody wants to know about. How has such a black, how, how has such an event has been blacked out so successfully from the hearts and minds of the people? How? Who is to blame? Is it them? Or is there a level of responsibility on us? If we are saying that, along, that the, imams, the, the mission of the Imam of our time is to revive the message of Ghadir, is to seek justice for the injustice that took place in Karbala, and that both of these are intertwined in such a way that they, they go hand in hand. In essence, Karbala took place because of the treachery that happened of the message of Ghadir, towards the message of Ghadir. If we are saying this is the primary mission of Imam alayhi salam, to revive that Islam, 
to, to bring back Islam, to implement Islam in such a way with the terms and conditions which were signed and sealed on the day of Ghadir. To the point that traditions tell us that when Imam begins implementing Islam the way Rasulullah had implemented it, the way Amir al-Mu'mineen had implemented it, people of the world will be amazed. And they will say, what is this new religion that he has brought? What kind of justice is this? What kind of economic prosperity is this? It's, this is not the Islam that we are accustomed to. And this is not because the Imam has brought about a new Islam, but rather he has revived the same Islam which Rasulullah was implementing. The same Islam that Amir al-Mu'mineen was implementing. But the same Islam which we have allowed to be buried and to, be, to and remain confined within the walls of our Imam Bargas. So when we talk about the Muslims being in a blackout, being oblivious about the message of Ghadir, there is no response, there is, a, there is responsibility that is placed on our shoulders. Not only that. We talk about Imam reviving the message of Ghadir. To defend, to bring back the message of Ghadir, to re-emphasize what happened on Ghadir. But do you know who was the initiator of the revival of this message of Ghadir? Who started this movement to wake, to awaken the hearts and minds of the people towards what the injustice that took place by the treachery towards the message of Ghadir? It was none other than Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. <laughs> Another alim whose name is Ibn Abil Hadid al Mu'tazili. He has written the exegesis of Nahj al Balagha in 23 volumes. One day, Ibn Abi al-Hadith, who is not a follower of the Ahl al-Bayt, he is a Mu'tazili. He asks his teacher, who was also not a follower of the, of the school of the Ahl al-Bayt. He says, tell me, when the daughter of Rasulullah came to the Khulafa of that time, and she said that this land of Fadak belongs to me. It was given to me as a gift within the lifetime of the Prophet. I had complete control of this land within the lifetime of the Prophet. I was taking the kharaj of this land, the income of this land, within the lifetime of the Prophet. You have taken it away from me. This, the student, Ibn Abi al-Hadid, is asking his teacher. He's saying, I ask you, the Prophet of Allah, his ihsan on our heads, on our shoulders, can it ever be repaid? Can we ever really appreciate what the Prophet of Allah has done for us? The, ch the way he has changed our lives. If his daughter comes and she asks for a small piece of land from the vast lands that existed at the, at the time within the hands of the Muslim Ummah, if she asks for a small orchard in the, in the outskirts of Medina, even if she was wrong, is it not worthy for the sake of Rasulullah just to give her that? What does logic say? If the daughter of your teacher who has brought you up was to come and say that this pen or this book belonged to, my, to, my, to me, I gave, my father gave it to me, would you even begin to argue with her? For the sake of your teacher, you would just give it to her. He says, what, what, why did they then refuse her the claim? He said... That if they were to give her the land of Fadak, they would be shooting themselves in the leg. Why? Because once they have accepted that Fatima is on the truth, that Fatima is, 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 it does not lie, and her claim is always the truth, then the next day she could have come and said, well, I have also heard Rasulullah say that the Khilafah is for Ali. And so to stop tomorrow from coming, it is much easier to falsify the claim of Fatima, to call her a liar, Ma'ad Allah, to dismiss her claim with regards to this small piece of land, so that, they, so that we don't have to face the follow-up question, which is the question with regards to this chair that we are sitting on. And so to avoid that difficult question, they falsified Fatima to Zahra, alayhi salam. No, more than that, the stance of Fatima, that the stance that Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam took with regards to defending and bring and reviving the message of Ghadir is one in which there is a big lesson for all of us. Till the day of judgment, she has set a stance 
And by Allah, that stance is explained so beautifully in many different arguments that took place between our ulama. For example, we find the same, answer, the same example given in the life of Allam al-Hilli when he was a small child and he was asked by his father to go and bring a company, a alim, from the other schools of thought who had come to visit him. But the tradition I want to narrate, or the, the incident that I want to narrate in front of you, is of the same alim, Allam al-Amini, and that took place in the middle of Makkah. And it wasn't that far away. In 1966, one of our greatest ulama, one of our greatest mujtahideen, who uh, Ayatullah al umma al-Hakim, Muhsin al-Hakim, when he went to do Hajj in 1966, we're only talking 40, 50, 60 years ago, not very far. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the emperor of the time, or the king of the time, requested him to lead Salatul Jama'ah in, in Makkah al-Mukarram. The same ulama who today would, would vomit if they knew that a Shia has touched the wall of the Kaaba, that the cloth of the Kaaba would become najis if any of us touched it. The same ulama only 40, 50 years ago were very accepting these conflicts that we see, the differences that we see, between the Muslims today, where they are chopping each other's throats. The conflicts existed, the differences existed, but not to the extent of animosity. And so we are talking about the 60s, when Allam al-Amini went to do Hajj. By then he had already published the book of Ghadir. And so when he did Hajj, when he completed Hajj, the various ulama of Makkah al-Mukarramah came, and they wanted to invite him to a dawah. Because it was a great honor to invite one of the greatest ulama of the school of the Ahl al-Bayt to food. <coughs> and he kept refusing one person, second person, third person. But when the pressure mounted up on him so much, he said, okay, let's do this. Appoint one of you and we will all gather together in the house of that person to have a meal once and for all. But my condition is that no one talks about any matters of differences between the schools of thought. I don't want any arguments. I'm not here to make enemies. I'm not here to argue with anyone. And so they all accepted. Okay, no problems. We won't talk about religion. We will just have food and we'll all go home. The day came. They ate the food. The food finished. Then one alim stood up from the ulama of Makkah. And he said, I have heard a tradition of Rasulullah, in which Rasulullah says that if a few people gathered together, and they do not talk about any matter of religion, then that gathering is in vain. And so, while we do not want to talk about matters of difference and we do not want to have a Q&A, let us all just go around the room and each one of us just recites a small tradition of Rasulullah that he knows, so that at least we, have the, we take the tawab and the benefit of this gathering and we receive the tawab. And so they go around the room. The first person recites, recites the tradition, the second, the third, the fourth, the tenth, the twentieth. Here, Allam al-Amini began sensing a conspiracy. Because the flavor of all the traditions seemed the same. The Fulan was great, Fulan was great, Fulan was great, Fulan was great. This is the greatness of Fulan, this is the greatness of Fulan. And so he got the gist that there is a conspiracy here at hand. When they all finished and the turn came to Allam al-Amini. He said, look. I will recite a tradition and I want you all to give me a response with regards to the authenticity of this tradition. All the traditions that you have all recited, we are not in agreement with all of us. But I will recite a tradition and I want you with honesty and integrity to tell me whether this tradition is authentic in your eyes or not. And after that, as your guest, a guest has rights. As your guest, I would allow you and, and, plea, and plead to you to let me ask you one question. I know nobody was supposed to ask questions, but you have started the circle of study. I will recite a tradition. You authenticate, then let me ask a question. They said, okay, no problem. What's that tradition? He says, do you accept that Rasulullah has said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, man mata wa lam ya'rif imam zamanihi mata mitatan jahiliya. He who dies without recognizing, without knowing, and in some traditions without the bay'ah of the imam of his zamana, he has died the death of a pagan, ignorant person, meaning his life is worthless. They all said, testify, yes, we all accept that this is 100% an authentic tradition. 
Now you might ask, Haslan, if all the ulama of the Muslims accept that the tradition of Rasulullah, man mata wa lam ya'rif imam zamanihi mata mitat al-jahiliya, they accept this as being 100% correct and authentic, then why the differences? The reason is, the difference is in the interpretation of the hadith. They say, Fulan was the Imam of the time. Fulan says, Fulan was the Imam of the time. Some people have the audacity to come on television and say, Yazid, Ma'adullah, was the Imam of his time. And Hussein was supposed to obey Yazid. This is the level of interpretation of these traditions. And so everybody authenticated the tradition that he who dies without knowing the Imam of his time dies the death of ignorance. He said, Question. One question. Do you think Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam died the death of ignorance? And if the answer is no, then tell me, at the time of her death, who was the Imam of Zamana of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam? And they were, well, there was pin drop silence in the room. Why? They could not answer. Because within the Sahah books, within Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi, they write that Fatima died till the last moment upset and angry with those two. So immediately, Allah was narrating. He said, all of a sudden, I noticed that gathering which was stuck to the chairs in anticipation of, a, of drama. One by one, they began standing up, making fable excuses and running away from the gathering. One person stood up and said, oh, I've got an appointment with my doctor. And I'm already late. Inshallah, I will give you the answer tomorrow. And he disappeared. The other person says, oh, I was supposed to take my wife to visit her mother. And I'm late and I'm going. So one by one, they all make, began making fable excuses and they all disappeared. But look, the stance that Fatima, that Fatima to Zahra alayhi Today people, even within our communities, object. What was the need for Fatima to Zahra to, take, to make a stance? What did she accomplish? But that one stance was had the ability to uncover the hypocrisy from the face of the people of the time and from the face of the people that exist today. I will, I will end with a question. I ask you, all oh my brothers and my sisters, the event of Ghadir, which is one of the main responsibilities to revive by Imam Zamana, the, one of the greatest responsibilities of Imam is to revive the message of Ghadir. The message of Ghadir, for which such great sacrifices took place, Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam offered the sacrifice of not only her life and the life of her child Muhsin, but the lives of 11 progenies from her line, of her sons and daughters. Such a great event that has carried uh, the sacrifice of, of the greatest personalities in existence. What level of responsibility does that event have on the shoulders of you, of you and me? What, what, I, what is my responsibility towards that event, which was the catalyst to the tragedy of Karbala taking place? <coughs> what is my responsibility? And we will pick up, inshallah, from here tomorrow. What a sacrifice that Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam offered. Eleven generations or ten generations, if you discount Imam al Hassan al Hussein as one generation. Ten generations of her sons and daughters martyred all to suppress the idea and the message of Ghadir. Yes, by Allah. Today, the son of Fatima arrives in Karbala. It was a day like today, year 62, year 61 Hijrah, when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam landed in Karbala. He has bid farewell to everyone in Medina. He has left Fatima to Sughra alayhi salam. He goes towards Mecca. He remains in Mecca. He is bombarded with sacks of letters from the people of Kufa inviting him to come to them. He sends his messengers to Basra, to Kufa, to other parts of the Islamic empire to test the waters. He wants to start, he wants to do Hajj. When he hears about the conspiracy of, of Yazid ibn Muawiyah to assassinate him, in the, even in the vicinity of the Holy Kaaba, and so to protect the sanctity of, of, of Kaaba and, and the Holy House of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he leaves the, the rituals of the Hajj 
and he departs from Makkah heading towards Karbala. He's, and on the way, he received the news of Muslim ibn Aqil. On the way, he is stopped by the army of Hur, and inshallah, more details will come in nights to come. On a day like today, history writes Imam al Hussein's caravan enters Karbala. He comes to a point where his horse would not move an inch. Imam says, Abbas, maybe the horse is tired. The horse is changed. Seven horses are changed. When the Imam says that the horse will not move an inch from, from its place, Imam recognizes that there is something that we need to inquire about. Imam says, call upon the people of this land. The people of Banu Asad were brought in front of Imam. Imam says, tell me, what is the name of this land? They say this is the earth or this is the land of Ghaburiya. He says, is there another name for this land? They say it is known as Shattul Furad. It is the, 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 the valley of Furad. Imam says, is there another name with which this land is known? They say it is known as the earth of Nainawa. Imam says, no, is there an ancient name for this land? They say there is an elderly person in our town who might know. He is brought to Imam. He looks at Imam. He says, Ya ibn Rasulillah, I plead to you to leave this land immediately. For my ancestors have, have told me that. Not a single prophet of Allah has passed over this land except that calamities have befallen him. O oh, son of Rasul Allah, I plead to you to leave this land. Imam said, no, tell me what is the ancient name for this land. He said, I have heard from my ancestors that this land is known as Ardu Karbin wa Bala. Imam says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon min Ardu Karbin wa Bala. Imam says, Allah to Allah we belong and to him we shall return from the land of calamity and pain oh Abbas put down our rihal here put down our tents here erect the tents the tents were erected oh Abbas oh Abbas here we here this is the final abode for us the tents are erected lady Zainab is accompanied by her brother Hussein to her tent with such great honor Honor. Here Lady Zainab says to her brother Hussein, she says, Oh brother Hussein, I want to say, say, share a secret with you. Mm -hmm. He says, what is it? She says, Oh brother Hussein, I am hearing the voice of a, of a lady crying and wailing for you. He says, Oh sister Zainab, do you not recognize this is our mother Fatima to Sahra alayha salam. She has accompanied us from the moment we left Medina. Lady Zainab says, Oh so Oh, brother Hussein, I can smell the fragrance of your blood within the soil of this land. Oh, brother Hussein, let us leave this land. He says, Zainab, now we cannot leave. This is the land which was the, this is the promised land. This is the land where Akbar will fall. This is the land where the, where the body of Qasim will be mutilated. This is the land where Shimmer will sit on my chest. Imam then comes out and he calls upon the people of Banu Asad. He buys the land with, with, generous, with generous amount. He then gifts the land back to Banu Asad. And he says, I have a few requests to make. He said, the first request is that when my Shias come, they will, the, our graves will be in this land. He said, when my Shias come, show them the position of my grave so that they can do my ziyarah and hold them as your guests for three days and three nights. He said, when we are mounted by the army of Yazid, he calls upon the men folks of the Banu Asad. He says, when the army of Yazid goes and you see our bodies left on the plains of Karbala, I beseech you to come and offer us a burial. Then he turns to the women folks of Banu Asad and he says, look, if your men are fearful for their lives, then you come and bury us. <laughs> then he looks at the children of Banu Asad and he says that if your parents are fearful for their lives, then I, the son of Fatima, am asking you and pleading to you that while you are playing around, grab a few handfuls of dust and throw it on my body. Imam Zamana mentions this in the in Ziyarat al Nahiyah. He captures this. He says, Assalamu alam al Dafanahu ahlul Qura. Salams to that Gharib Hussein who was buried by the strangers. Hey. 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 Hey.
القول الظالمين سيعلم الذين ظلموا ان السلام عليك يا ابا عبد الله وعلى الارواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله ابدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله اخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى اولاد الحسين وعلى اصحاب الحسين oh allah we ask you to protect islam O oh Allah, we ask you to protect our brother Muslims all around the world. O oh Allah, we ask you to keep in your protection the zuwar of Imam Al Hussein alayhi wasallam. O oh Allah, we ask you to keep to gather these tears in the rumal of Fatima al Zahra alayhi wasallam and to make them a form of intercession for us on the day of judgment. O oh Allah, we ask you to forgive our sins, the sins of our parents. O oh Allah, we ask you to hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi sahib al Asri wa Saman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa 